Buenos días. Eh, Alice eh, and Irasema, thank you very much for um, inviting me. This is great, and the workshop has been, uh, uh, we have learned uh, many things, so this is great. Um, I, I would, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I, I will uh, show today uh, results of um, a project that we had among several institutions in Mexico and also one from, uh, from Sweden, from uh, Ramon Fuentes Franco in Sweden and the others are from Mexico. What we did is uh, um, in a workshop that we had in Costa Rica a few years ago uh, about uh, regional modeling, uh, there we decided to do something together. And um, this is the result of that. Several institutions run uh, three different models, and then we, this is the result. Um, and and the, art, the results of this uh, has just been accepted in International Journal of uh, Climatology, so you can get it there. Oops. No se move. No se mueve. Es este, ¿no? Para avanzar. Así que solo tengo cuidado para no poner el dedo acá. Sí. Entonces, para diante. ¿Falta algo? Something is going on. Uh, I will call the. Uh, okay, to, I, I, to replace the bedroom. Okay, I, I, I will start, otherwise you will be late. Um, uh, so first I will I give uh, a short introduction about trends uh, around the globe and also in the continents, uh, the data and methodology that we used. Um, then the, uh, we evaluated the three regional climate models in this domain that is... Uh, a CORDEX Central America uh, domain. CORDEX means uh, Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment. And uh, CORDEX uh, has many domains around the world. And we uh, uh, just started to do some analysis in, uh, in CORDEX CAM. Uh, then I will uh, um, uh, present the climatic trends for uh, a subdomain over here. You need this? Okay, okay. Ah, perfect. And the other. Mm -hmm. Gracias. And, and the, the trends that we obtained, we wanted to know if uh, some... Um, interannual or decadal indices were related with the trends or trying to do uh, the first stage in, in attribution, then the conclusions and ongoing research. So the objective of this work was to investigate uh, climatic trends uh, related with temperature and precipitation in the cortex cam domain. Um, now the pointer doesn't work. <laughs> ah, here it is. Uh, so this is the cortex cam domain. The, the official is goes over here, the official one. But we think that uh, it is to, it, it, it divides into the North American monsoon region, so we extend it to 45 <laughs> degrees north to get uh, other uh, processes. Um, so we analyze uh, the period 1980-2010 for this uh, type of analysis. Uh, as you know, um, at the global scale, there has been uh, an increasing uh, trend in temperature, uh, especially since the 1970s, it's around uh, one degree Celsius increment. And uh, this, uh, uh, we also can see it in uh, the top of the uh, heat content of the ocean in the first uh, two kilometers. So for that reason, it's very important to see a regional scale what is happening. If we see the trends in the northern and southern hemisphere, also there is an increasing trend, especially, and it's stronger in uh, the northern hemisphere, like a half degree Celsius uh, larger than the southern hemisphere. 
Kumar et al. did uh, this global ana analysis uh, for uh, long-term trends, and uh, I will be focusing on this area, but also you can see that there is a, a strong positive trend here in, in southern <coughs> Brazil. Uh, for our interest, we see that in this uh, period, there is this positive uh, negative trend uh, in, in our region. And the reason we wanted to do this analysis is because if we're interested in uh, uh, future projections, we need to know if the regional models uh, reproduce well some of the features, some of this kind of evaluation. And also because the CIM5 models, although they have this positive uh, trend, they do not uh, capture the regional uh, uh, trends that we see. For example, it is too, too light. Therefore, it is important to use uh, regional climate modeling in order to capture other type of processes. And, um, and Kumar et al, when they saw this um, uh, type of uh, signal, this positive, negative, a signal. They wanted to know if this is consistent throughout the century or it changes through different periods. Well, so they have this other paper and uh, where they divided by 30 year periods and, and also by seasonal. And what they saw is that in some periods they have the same uh, trend. In other periods it's positive, negative. And then the most recent one is, is more or less positive but not as strong in uh, um, uh, in, like this one. And then during winter, the signatures are even stronger. Um, and they um, did some analysis and they found that this negative trend uh, that we see in the eastern part of the domain is related to the negative Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. Um, as a reminder, uh, the negative uh, Atlantic uh, Multidecadal oscillation is, is linked to very strong uh, uh, North Atlantic uh, subtropical high because it's cold, the ocean is cold, and therefore there is entrance of moisture and rainfall over this region, and that uh, cools uh, this part. However, the, when we have a positive AMO, there is uh, a positive trends all over. And for us, is we are interested in this uh, in this domain. So here is the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation that we have seen in several talks. And our period is from uh, 1980 to 2000. So there is a positive trend in the in the data. Uh, and therefore, if we have this positive trend, we expect some uh, positive. Uh, uh, temperature trends in our domain according to Kumar et al. Uh, article. And by the way, when, when uh, the Atlantic is, is warm, uh, of course that uh, promotes uh, a larger cyclonic activity, and this is observed in the accumulated cyclone er energy and also more intense cyclones. Because in this, at least the eastern domain, uh, is affected by the AMO, by the size and intensity of the uh, North, North Atlantic subtropical high, the NASH, and also by uh, tropical cyclones. And while the western side of the domain will be affected by El Nino, of course, El Nino also affects uh, this other size uh, uh, of the domain, uh, and also by the uh, phases of the uh, Pacific decadal oscillation. Uh, and and uh, when there is a positive AMO, uh, the NASH uh, weakens, and therefore less moisture enters to uh, northwestern Mexico in the monsoon, and therefore there are more uh, droughts. Uh, there is a tendency for more droughts in the main monsoon region during the positive AMO as we are now. We are in this stage uh, uh, in the last uh, 10, 10 years. Now, uh, for precipitation trends, the trends are weaker. Um, this is also from Kumar. Kumar Erao, 
And more or less, we see like a positive in the mid-latitude, tropics and mid-latitudes, and negative uh, here in the southern portion of the domain. And look at this a very strong positive trend in southern uh, southern Brazil. Uh, and again, the uh, semi five ensembles, uh, although they they produce this positive uh, negative. There are a lot of regional details that the CIMI-5 ensemble or the CIMI-5 model do not capture. And that's the reason we are doing the regional modeling. Uh, when we look at the station data around the world, um, there is, again, this positive trend in the subtropics, uh, subtropics and mid-latitudes. But in the southern portion, uh, there is incomplete data, and that's a big problem uh, for us. And again, the positive, so this is consistent with the crew data. This is another story about New et al. Uh, it doesn't look that well. This is, this is the 1930-2004, but looking at the uh, latest period, what we see is a negative. This is Mexico, southern U.S., and northern South America. So there is a general uh, negative trend in, uh, in precipitation. Here is the, the positive trend that we saw in Southern South America. Uh, so the other factor, as I mentioned before, is the, uh, the phases of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. When there is a positive uh, phase, we have a, a warming over the uh, um, California current. And therefore, the, the North Pacific High weakens, and that allows the entrance of moisture uh, to our uh, North, uh, the southern United States and, and Mexico. And the opposite occurs during the negative PDO. And we are more or less, we are analyzing 80 to 2010, so it's like a negative trend, so that would uh, reduce possibly uh, precipitation. Uh, so the recent question of this uh, work are, um, does the North American monsoon region show a significant temperature and precipitation trends? This is the core of the monsoon region. Yesterday, they were talking about the monsoon region as a big system, but where the changes of the winds are more strong and the main core of precipitation occurs here over the, uh, this is the Sierra Madre Occidental. This is uh, at the onset of the monsoon in 2006, and this is uh, spring. During winter, we have the influence of the subtropical westerly jet. The westerlies are very strong over here. We have the entrance of cold fronts and also um, atmospheric rivers. So all of these uh, interact with the subtropical westerly jet, and when it's farther south, the subtropical jet, when, for example, when we have El Niño years, then we have more entrance of moisture during uh, uh, autumn, winter, and, and spring. And, uh, he, and for this to occur, we need to have a warmer continent and cooler ocean uh, in order to get the onset of the North American monsoon. So we wanted to see the ability of three regional climate models and how they reproduce the trends. Uh, and if we wanted... In those regions where there are significant trends, we wanted to see if they are related to this uh, teleconnection, because it, there is a tendency in the media to say that everything is connected to the climate to climate change, but before that, we need to do some uh, uh, correlations uh, with the natural variability, and then the information that is not correlated with that possibly is related to, uh, to climate change. Uh, we, we use um, crude data, uh, that's, these are from observations, GPCP from satellite data, and CHIRPS is satellite and station data. Uh, we uh, analyze some um, spatial biases, annual cycles, trends, etc. The linear trends were um, checked with the uh, Mankendal and Sense Slope, and we analyze these three indices. For the model, we used uh, Prezi, which is a, a British model, uh, RCA4, which is a Sweden uh, model, and these two, two versions of RexCM4, uh, which is uh, the, Italian, the Italian model. 
uh, we did here two different uh, convective parameter <coughs> parameterizations to see if there were uh, any any change. So we analyzed 1979-2010. Uh, the first year was left out of the analysis for spin-up, and um, the resolution of the three mo of the three models were 50 kilometer uh, resolution, and all of them were hydrostatic. Because REXCM is already there is a version for uh, non-hydrostatic for those of you interested in that. But since oh, these other were hydrostatic, we use the hydrostatic version. So these this, uh, models were run in different, in different institutions in Mexico, and then we got together to do the analysis. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through the physical parameterization. The only thing that I want to say is that the two REXIM uh, models, they had the same physical parameterization, but because uh, they are from different versions, the results, we are not expecting that the results are the same. Uh, we only change the uh, convective uh, parameterization in one grail and the other in Tidki that have been analyzed in the, in the domain. Uh, so now the, I will show the evaluation for uh, this particular domain. Uh, here is the typical um, temp, uh, annual cycle of temperature. And what we see is that some of the models uh, have a cold bias um, throughout the year. Um, RCA4 reproduces very well uh, during the summer season, but it's cold again um, during winter. Most of the uh, SIMI5 models and SIMI3 models uh, have uh, this cold bias in, in, um, in the cord scam domain. <coughs> And uh, they st we, we still don't know uh, why is happening because this we see it in, in different models from different uh, initializations and, and uh, boundary conditions. And for precipitation, and when, even if they have biases, what we are well, what we look when we do the evaluation is that they capture the annual cycle in in a good way. Uh, for precipitation. All the models capture the annual cycle. Of course, some of them are, are drier and some of them are wetter. Uh, this REXCM is the wettest, uh, but the other one is, is, uh, is good. And um, here are GPCP and CRU. There is a very good agreement between the two <coughs> observational data sets. <coughs> Now, this is the, um, the, the pattern of uh, temperature in the domain is warmer along the, the coastal areas, cooler uh, over the mountains. And this pattern was well captured by all, all the models. However, when we see the biases, we find these cool uh, biases in more or less degree in all the simulations. And it's interesting because all of them were um, forced with era interim, which is warmer over here, but all of them got uh, negative uh, uh, biases over here. <clears throat> one, one thing that I, I want to um, notice is uh, several uh, articles have uh, highlighted that using some of these observational data set have their own biases because over the mountain areas, we don't have a station. We don't have stations. Therefore, some of these biases may be fine. These biases may, may be uh, not correct uh, because this um, crew data is already uh, has a warm bias because in the lower uh, altitudes is warm, so they extrapolate to the uh, high mountains, and therefore they show positive biases, which, in fact, they should be cooler. Okay, so we, we have to have uh, that in mind. And it's the same for precipitation. Uh, here we see uh, the typical tongue of moisture for the monsoon region. This is a very wet area, and of course, the southern Mexico and all Central America, and here is the the region that rains the most, according to uh, this scientist that showed yesterday. Um, I, I don't see her. Um, so it's, we see this maximum precipitation in crew and also from GPCP. 
Uh, but uh, GPCP rains a little bit more here over uh, uh, the southern portions of the, uh, over the Mesoamerican region. However, even though um, uh, CRU has a larger precipitation, we obtained the biases uh, uh, with respect to GPCP because we wanted to see how the model did in the, over the oceans. Uh, so what we see here is that over the continent, ERA interim and PRESI uh, have the lower biases. And we, when we go to RCA and REXCM, they have uh, positive biases over the mountain areas. But here again, we, we have a problem over, over the mountains. This is, this is um, data from CHIRPS' satellite with um, station data. And we, we, here we have a precipitation of the order of uh, a, a 1,500 uh, millimeters per year, which is a GPCP doesn't capture that. So some of these positive biases, that should be lower than that. So the r models are doing a little bit be better than, than uh, and, and uh, the biases that G GPCP has over the mountains, uh, is uh, documented in several articles by uh, Adler uh, et al. <clears throat> we, we check the interannual uh, variations in, in, uh, in the NAM region and also in southern Mexico uh, to see the differences in the subtropical, uh, tropics, subtropics, and the tropics. Usually, we expect that in winter in the subtropical regions, the variability is, is larger than in the tropics. And we see here in the models and observations capture well the difference between the annual or uh, winter, summer. In summer, the regional models uh, have problems reproducing several uh, metrics uh, during the summer season. It's, it's a, but we will see later that even the observations have problems. Um, this is for uh, precipitation as well in the uh, semi-arid region, there is larger variability uh, than over the tropical uh, <coughs> over the tropical regions. But the agreement is uh, uh, is a better agreement in the tropics than in the subtropical region, but it's it's not that, that bad. So now let's look at the uh, the temperature trends. Uh, this is the temperature trends for for the domain, and uh, these are. Uh, observation, era interim, and the regional models. We see, in general, there is a positive trend in the, in the whole domain, and that the largest uh, trends are observed over the monsoon region. And this is well captured. At least, the intensity is not well captured by the regional model, but at least they capture that there is a positive trend. And the other model, the model have a negative, weak, weak trends uh, in, in this part of the domain, the southern part of the domain. <clears throat> Here is the, uh, the interannual variability of uh, temperature over the uh, NAM region. Prezi and uh, era interim captured very well um, the intensity, the, the values of temperature, and the other models have a uh, cool bias, but still they, they produce the, the trend, but with less intensity. And this is, so it has, a, the NAM region has a 0.4 degrees Celsius uh, per decade, and it is uh, significant at the 95% level. Uh, we wanted to know if um, which season of the year uh, had the same uh, uh, increasing trend. And we see that in both winter and summer, we have significant trends in, uh, in the North American monsoon region. All the domain uh, have positive trends, but weaker in the, in the southern portion. Look at here in, uh, in the Caribbean region, the trends are stronger during the boreal summer than during the winter season. Um, when looking at decadal uh, changes in the annual cycle of temperature, we see uh, that every decade is warmer than the previous one over the NAM region, and especially during the summer. So we took uh, the summer months 
uh, and we did a Monte Carlo uh, bootstrapping analysis to see if the mean distribution of each decade had a significant change. So what we see here is uh, the distribution for the 1980s and then the 90s, the 2000s, and this last one is for the uh, 2010s. And every decade, the distribution is moving uh, to the right, warmer. And not only that, but for example, here in the 2010s, uh, the extreme tails of the distribution are far away from the uh, tails of the distribution in the 1980s. And, uh, and the mean, the, uh, the mean uh, uh, for example, this one, the mean uh, temperature in the uh, 2000s is, is the P95 of the uh, uh, 1980s. So the change is uh, very significant, not only in the mean, but also in the extremes. So we, we uh, say that the North American monsoon region is already a hot, hot spot uh, uh, region uh, because of the increasing temperature and the droughts that we have uh, uh, been experiencing in the last uh, decade. And that uh, also has produced a lot of fires and uh, problems with water and uh, other resources. When, when looking at uh, future scenarios, we see uh, that the North American monsoon region compared to the tropical region is uh, a it, it could be uh, much warmer than the tropics, and we see it right now that the trends in the northern portion of the domain are stronger than in the tropical regions, and we see this in, in the future scenario. This is a work that we did uh, comparing different uh, way, way, weighted samples, uh, because some, some models do not reproduce well some of the characteristics of the climate of a region. So it is very important, one, to select the best models or to constrain, we call it now a, a constrained ensemble, and to give less weight to models that do not reproduce well uh, some of the characteristics. So now the, uh, these are the observed trends of precipitation from crew, GPCP, uh, CHIRPS, and this is ERA interim. So what we see here is there is a drying uh, trend uh, in the subtropics, and there is agreement um, in the three observational data set, and we saw that also for the new ERAL paper for a shorter period. Uh, so we continue to have this negative trend. So there is negative trend and positive trend uh, here over the coastal uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. However, we see a difference between two observational data sets. Here is, Cruz says that it's a positive trend, and GPCP shows a strong negative trend over here. And CHIRPS is a weak, weak trend, but more consistent with, the, with Cruz. And ERA interim follows the pattern of GPCP. So we see a negative, positive, negative, uh, and there is a positive trend that is a consistent here in, the, in uh, Northern South America, Panama. A, a strong positive trend in these two, and also era interim, which is even stronger. Uh, so now the, the models, the models show this negative trend in the subtropics, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes stronger than it, they should be, but at least they, they have this positive and the negative trend in the southern portion of the domain. The, this is in millimeters per decade, uh, so I will show um, later in in percent, because in this area it rains so little that it is important to see it in percent, to see uh, better the influence. Uh, oh, here, here is in percent per decade. Now is, we see that uh, the drying conditions in, in this uh, portion of the domain is very important, but the intensities, uh, intensities are different from the different observational data sets. <laughs> And there is like a positive trend, but very, very weak. And the, and the regional model, they show this negative trend in the NAM region and a weak positive trends uh, in the other part of the domain. <clears throat> uh, so we, in, since the, uh, this is the most consistent trend that we saw, uh, 
in both temperature and precipitation. So we did a correlation analysis with uh, ENSO, PDO, and AMO uh, to see if there was a part of this trend could be explained by these indices. So we did trend the time series first. And uh, so we, we have here in the article uh, the, the a series and then the trend series. This is for 1980, 2010. If we look only to the last period, it seems that these um, teleconnection indices don't have anything to do with temperature and precipitation in the NAM region. Then we say, well, if these indices don't have anything to do, may maybe it's climate change. However, the trends depends on the time period that we are analyzing. So it's very important uh, to open up, when we have a result with trends, to open up the time series. If it is possible, sometimes we don't have the data, so we focus on that. But for crew, we had a larger time series. So we, when we see the correlations with a larger time series, then we see that uh, the, the correlation that we saw here, some of these uh, is still prevail. Um, and what we expected is the positive AMO uh, produces larger temperature over the domain. And for precipitation, uh, we expect that when there is a negative AMO, there is more rainfall. Right now, we are in a positive AMO, so it's dry. It's dry right now. And um, there is a connection also with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and in a less degree with the El Nino, uh, with El Nino Southern Oscillation. The thing with the El Nino Southern Oscillation is that the strength of the influence depends also on the phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillations. Something like uh, Mary was telling yesterday for South America, it is important to do this connection when there is in phase and out of phase with other indices to see the, sometimes they cancel out. Uh, so it's important in future work to do all, some of these combinations. And, and here is the, um, so we have in a, a positive trend for the AMO, AMO, therefore we expect drying conditions as we see, and for the PDO, uh, there is a negative trend, therefore we expect drying conditions and warming conditions, which <coughs> is consistent. But only one part of this trend is explained by this natural oscillation. So there is another part that can be explained by other factors or by climate change. But for climate change, it is, to do attribution is not that simple. It's, it's a more complex, that's why we haven't done it yet, but uh, uh, we, we will see um, Marcia, Silis, um, PhD thesis and see uh, we can do some uh, an, uh, attribution analysis. Uh, when we see the annual trends, it's important to know which season shows um, uh, the trends and, uh, and if they change from winter to summer. So the negative trend that we saw uh, occurs mainly during win the winter season and there is a good agreement between the three observational data sets positive and negative. And this is something that um, um, there are uh, studies that have analyzed how the Hadley cell ha has changed and it has expanded a little bit in the last 40 years. And that means that uh, it may rain less over the tropics and a little bit more in the northern uh, parts of the domain. And we see it here. And um, this is for winter. For summer, the negative trend continues here, much weaker. Uh, and there is agreement here in, in this part, that even this positive trend, uh, it, it, there is agreement in, in the three observational data set. But the problem, again, is here over uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean region, where there is a, a di different um, trend. Um, so, some stories uh, based on GPCP. Adler, there are several articles, but uh, Adler et al, the, they developed the GPCP, and they say that this version of GPCP have problems capturing uh, topographic uh, uh, precipitation. So in, in high level, complex terrain, GPCP uh, has an, uh, a bias. So that's a problem. The other problem is the, the observations. 
uh, there are we have less observation in, in these areas and that for that reason uh, possibly there are uh, uh, uncertainties in the different data set but i want to highlight this because we have uncertainties in uh, uh, regional models but also in the observational data set so more monitoring is is uh, important when this this positive trend of precipitation uh, increases uh, if we include September. And the thing is, in the last decade, we have this uh, positive AMO. Uh, the positive is warm in this region. Uh, so warming conditions uh, favor more uh, cyclonic uh, disturbances. And all this region is affected by, by um, uh, cyclones. However, when we have the positive AMO, we have um, a weaker Nash. So a weaker Nash, um, a little bit can cancel out because uh, much, when, when Nash is strong, there is more entrance of moisture to this region. And when it weakens, there is less entrance of moisture to this region. But because it's warm, we will have tropical cyclones that they uh, uh, allow the entrance of moisture uh, precipitation. So it is like a a little bit uh, um, cancelling out. That's why we don't, we, in part, we don't see that uh, strong, um, significant uh, trends, but it's positive. And there is a, a good agreement here, uh, and, and still the positive trends in this uh, southern, northern part of the uh, South America. <clears throat> so here are the the factors that I just I just mentioned. So the conclusion is that in the evaluation, the, the RCMs are able to capture the trends, uh, especially during the winter season. During the summer, um, there is, uh, they have more problems. Uh, they capture the seasonal uh, variability, and, uh, but they tend to be cooler and drier uh, than the observations. The trends, the most significant trends is in the North American monsoon region, uh, very significant uh, warming. The uh, drying trend is not that, uh, is negative, but not that strong as, as the significant warming in the, in the domain. And the, because there are, since there are several factors that are, uh, some of these factors cancel out, and that's why the, 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 the um, Final uh, trend is not that significant. <clears throat> um, the winter negative precipitation trends in the subtropics are captured by the RCM, but not during the summer. And we have a problem with GPCP and crew, and this is uh, related to resolution, uh, data availability, and some problems uh, by the satellite data. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, the satellite, as I said, uh, as I said before, uh, have problems over over the mountains. So, um, based on these results, there are some unresolved questions that it would be important to um, continue. So, we want to know if uh, uh, if the warming trend that we see in the North American uh, monsoon region can be attributed to climate change or other factors. And um, in, in the uh, winter uh, negative trends that we see, um, the jet stream should have some influence. So I have a, right now a, a PhD student who is analyzing, is characterizing the jet stream, um, the historical, uh, she's doing the historical analysis. She just finished that and looking at trends and how the subtropical jets change with uh, uh, El Niño, La Niña and neutral conditions. We, we know when there is an, an El Niño, the subtropical jet stream is, is uh, crosses Mexico and during La Niña is farther north. But also um, the changes in the, in the Hadley cell. Uh, because changing the Hadley cell will change also uh, the subtropical jet. And um, what is the combined impact of the AMO and NASH uh, on the positive summer precipitation trends in the Gulf of Mexico uh, to do all these combinations? Um, 
And how are extreme events changing in the region? We already saw that temperature trends are increasing, but and, and they are far away from um, uh, the tails of the distribution of the 1980s. So can those tails of the distribution in the recent period can be explained by uh, climate change or not? So attribution analysis. Um, an important thing is period of analysis is very important when we, when we do uh, trend analysis and highlighting uh, problems with, uh, with uh, um, data uncertainties. So here is my, my uh, Rosa Luna is uh, uh, analyzing the changes in the subtropical jet stream. Uh, because the winter, winter uh, jet stream for us is very important for, uh, it modulates the entrance of cold fronts uh, and also precipitation. So the interaction of the uh, subtropical jet with cold fronts and also with atmospheric <coughs> rivers will modulate the uh, precipitation and temperatures uh, in over Mexico. So she is working on that. And I have uh, another uh, PhD student that she's working on detection and attribution of extreme precipitation events. She already finished the um, detection, and the next step will uh, be the attribution, doing um, some uh, similar to Marcia Sealy, how um, this can be explained by climate change, or, or maybe not, depending on the results. So, uh, many of the, uh, these are some of the processes uh, in the core scam domain. Some of them have been already investigated, but we need more students who want to do a thesis in uh, some of these processes. So it would be very nice if you consider this. And uh, just to close my uh, presentation, the results of the trend analysis, we uh, created an interactive web page. Where, uh, where you can um, select your own domain, subdomain within our domain, and uh, get the uh, trends and uh, do plots and etc. So, um, please uh, use this uh, page. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gracias. <laughs> A very nice presentation. So uh, the regional model results that you showed are the ensemble of all um, runs for each GCM, right? No, the regional models that are showed uh, are regional models, first with era interim. Oh, because we wanted interim. to do the first the uh, observation and an analysis to see if the models capture the observations. Okay, now yes. they, they, they were nudged towards the reanalysis, right? Yes, yes. And they all have to follow the same protocol, the same kind of nudging? The same? The same kind of nudging? Well, uh, we, um, they were forced with the same, the only thing that they did is to force uh, the initial and boundary conditions with uh, era interim at uh, every four hours. Oh, there is no nudging towards the era interim? Yes, yes, because there, is, that, there isn't? Is what? There is nudging or no? No, nudging, no. It no. is only the forcing boundary condition and initial conditions. Okay. Yeah, they, they didn't put a nudge uh, inside. Okay. Yes. Now, the other question is, uh, uh, this, uh, it shows a very nice, uh, a good example that the resolution of the original model plays a big role because you have the Gulf of California <laughs> and then you have the Sierra Madres. Mm -hmm. So 50 kilometers is still pretty coarse to resolve these uh, uh, local circulations. Yes. And do you know if there are any plans to increase the resolution in Cordex? Oh, th that is already uh, 25 kilometer resolutions. Mm -hmm. The um, Swedish model already has um, a present and future uh, scenarios with 10 models. And they have it in, in the web page and their web page, web page. Uh, for REXCM, they already finished the 25 kilometer resolution for most of the domains around the world. Uh, but uh, for example, um, they just finished uh, two months ago. Okay. 
Uh, so, for example, my PhD students, they are already working with the, the 25 kilometer resolution data because they gave it to me in May <laughs> directly. But they will, uh, they plan to put it in the web page this year. They, think they, they cannot put it directly in the web page because they need to follow a protocol. So it's complicated to do the data protocol, and that's why, but uh, asking them, they can, if someone needs, they can send an email and get the data. Alan. <laughs> Thank you for your interesting presentation, Dr. Teresa. Uh, I have a question uh, related about the observation that you use, which compared with the regional climate models. You showed that uh, different observations have different results about temperature or precipitation and the trends too. Uh, when you have this difference, which resource of observation you choose to compare with directional climate models? Um, I, I think it's important to do, like, first of all, um, decide before, we decided before seeing these things. So we, we had a, an agenda, uh, crew data is the most used data analysis. So for continent, uh, we usually use crew. However, since uh, the model have data over the ocean, simulate, uh, the simulation over the ocean, it is important to see what is going on over the ocean. And that's why sometimes we change and, and uh, do the um, analysis with some other data set. But we try to, once we see these differences, we try to use the one that shows, that, that has been used um, several times, and I think um, it's complicated because then then you bias your results. It is the mo that's what we left it in this way so to let know um, uh, that there are differences, and then you choose. And there are new data sets. For example, so, some of the reviewers told us why not to use Trim, but Trim doesn't have the whole period. And since we were doing trend analysis, we needed a data that started in 1980. But for shorter period or for evaluation in a shorter period, you can use stream or some other um, uh, hope or I don't know. There are different data sets. And now it is very common to have these spaghetti of different observational data sets. So you can see in, for your region which data sets are better. And then you choose. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you showed that there is a, a very strong influence of A and O in that region, <coughs> and also there there is influence of uh, the North Atlantic subtropical high, and uh, this uh, shifting maybe our intensification of the North Atlantic uh, subtropical high uh, related to AMO. This is uh, changing the precipitation in the NAMS region uh, related to these trains you are yeah, Yes, there, there is a, well, there are two things. There is a, a, a story that I cite in the article that the, uh, the analysis it was done for uh, the position and intensity of NASH. And what they have found in the last 30 years is that NASH has moved more toward the continent, which is opposite to the positive AMO, and it has more variability. So that variability affects the southern US and the Gulf of Mexico region, because sometimes it's going to be wetter and, and, and sometimes drier, depending on the position. So this can tear out a little bit the influence of the AMO, or the positive AMO, because in positive AMO we expect weaker nuts. So there are other factors. And, and uh, for the North American monsoon, we haven't done a direct analysis of checking nuts. We haven't. I just jumped to the conclusion that because we have a positive uh, nuts, uh, positive AMO, we have a weaker uh, nuts, but there is this story that, that shows that this closer to the continent. So, 
possibly these, these uh, different factors make that the trends in that region are positive but not significant. Here. There is a, I, have a, I have two questions for you. Uh, one um, related to, to the possibility of isolating um, the tropical storms in your data set, like uh, removing, filtering these uh, tropical storms, if, if there is any, any, any idea, if it's possible to do that. And the other question is more related to uh, the theory about kneeling, kneeling folks and sh uh, that they have said that uh, the, the wet get wetter. Uh, and uh, because I feel like we're looking at things like AMO um, and ASH, but we're not looking at the ITCZ per se, which is a, influences very much the, the region as well. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have to put some thoughts on Yes. Well, for the for the first question, um, it is yes, it is possible to remove um, the precipitation related with tropical cyclones. We did not. We use just the because this is a annual and seasonal uh, analysis. We didn't remove, but that's an interesting point to see if removing uh, that if that will affect, for example especially the eastern side of the domain. And, and for the other question, uh, the ITCC is one of the things, I didn't put it there, but yes, uh, it would be very important to do the analysis for that. We haven't done it for DINAM and for Mexico, so it's, it's an area of opportunity. Last question. Okay. Right. Uh, well, regarding this question of discrepancy, uh, between the different uh, data sets. Uh, well, it's not observed. Actually, I, I agree that data set sometimes from different origin satellite and even a rain gauge. Uh, to decide which one represents best your uh, region, uh, well, have you tried to compare with real observed station data, because this probably would help to, to decide yes. between them. Yes, yeah, we, have, we have done that for the North American monsoon, and we have uh, some papers. Uh -huh. uh, but and to do it for the whole domain is complicated. Uh -huh. That's why. Uh -huh. But for this region, you have done this assessment. Yes. What did you conclude? The crew, crew data uh, compares well. Uh -huh. But we haven't done it with uh, GPCP. Uh, we have done it with CRU. Uh, with okay. CRU, and there is a new data set that is called LIMNE data set that uh, includes uh, Canada, US, and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, do, we didn't put it here, because it ends in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And there are discrepancies between CHIRPS, because CHIRPS is 6.5 kilometer resolution. I like CHIRPS as well. But there are discrepancies between CHIRPS and LIMNE, so for you to know in some regions of Mexico. And both of them are a six kilometer resolution. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that when they, in big areas of Mexico, data have a lot of gaps, or we don't have the data, so they just interpolate with whatever uh, program they are using. Mm -hmm. And they, they use different ways of greeting. Mm -hmm. and yes. A, another thing is a, actually a comment. Uh, I like it very much uh, one comment you made and also the approach of your study. So you said trends, and this is obvious, but sometimes it's forgotten. Uh, trends depend on the time period analyzed. So before talking about trends, one has to look where these what trends is are valid. And if it is uh, convenient to talk about trend, because this is actually a strong word. Exactly. And as you said, it's a problem with the media. When you talk about trends, everybody associates with anthropogenic climate change. And when observations in the future get re <laughs> a reversed uh, trend, 
So it's a, we lose, uh, they lose confidence in the, in, in the scientists. And uh, from the point of view of the approach, what you did first when you look at these trends, you first tried to associate with natural variability to see exactly. if there is any very strong reason uh, in uh, uh, attributing to other kind of, of sources. Exactly. Yeah, and, no, I, I like this. Uh, and and the other much. thing uh, related with the trends is looking at what is published already. Uh -huh. uh, this this uh, work by Kumar et al. and New et al. that have done <laughs> A global analysis and also by periods, mm -hmm. and they have suggested some possible uh, forcings. It's very important because what about if I choose to do 1970 to 2000? So it's in the middle of one sign, and the, so there is no trend. Yeah. Okay. And it's just to realize mm -hmm. um, if something is already done, then we, we have consistency with uh, these other words. Yeah, and, and it's important to make these kind of, of uh, considerations very clear yes. in the analysis. Up front. Yeah. And sometimes, up front. Up exactly. front, exactly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there is not, nothing published. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with something. Mm -hmm. And then when you do the analysis or the possible connection with the indices, then you start to realize that possibly it wasn't the best mm -hmm. period to do, to do the analysis or just to explain that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, please, next talk, Cayo Coelho. Uh, good morning, everyone. <coughs> I'd like to start by acknowledging the invitation by Alice, Manuel Gan, Iracema, and all the organizing committee for being here today. I'll be showing you uh, the recent developments that we have been doing at our center, the Center for Weather Forecast and Climate Studies, CPTEC, INPE, in Brazil. And this is a effort of a large number of people. You can see a lot of names on the presentation, and uh, in collaboration also with the University of Reading. And we have a collaborator there, that's Steve Uno, who is an uh, expert in this field, and he's helping us uh, developing this uh, activity. So, um, and a large part of all the results and everything that I'm going to be showing here is uh, effort and uh, of a PhD student, who is Bruno Guimarães, of our PhD program. So all uh, the work and all the results are his. And he took the challenge of taking our idea of trying to uh, configure a model, a global model, and test several configurations, running lots of hindcasts to help us to try to, oh, sorry. To help us to try to uh, come up with a, a model for making subseason predictions. So the plan is to start with a very brief introduction about what is a subseasonal prediction, and then an uh, introduction to our model that Iracema already mentioned a few days ago, the Brazilian atmospheric model. Next, we will have a look at uh, what were the configurations of the model that we came up with and for producing the hindcast, which are retrospective predictions for previous years, and the strategy we followed to select the model that had the best configuration for this time scale. <coughs> After that, we will have a look at the results and you see the quality of these forecasts for uh, precipitation, two meter temperature, and the Madden and Julian oscillation, and finally a summary. 
So when we talk about weather, we all know we are talking about short time scales of minutes, hours, and days. And uh, if we are talking about future weather, uh, we are talking about the weather forecast. Then we have the now casting for the short time scale, the medium range for a few days in the future. And in climate, we are looking at more longer scales of months, decades, or centuries. And in the future, we are talking about climate uh, forecasts or climate projections. So uh, for the monthly scale, we have up to the seasonal prediction. For the decadal scale, we have the decadal predictions. And for the centennial scale, we have the projections that we saw a few results uh, in this uh, workshop already. So what uh, the scientific and the applications communities have uh, found out during the last few years is that there is a clear gap between the weather and the climate prediction. And then we need to try to fill this gap by making some predictions for these time scales, which are the weekly time scales. Cannot, doesn't need to be weekly, but usually we start by looking at weekly. And this is what we call the subseasonal predictions. So uh, another um, uh, interesting aspect that has been recognized by the scientific community in the last few years is that <clears throat> the subseasonal prediction problem is a mixed predictability problem. As we are reading between weather, <clears throat> I need my water. Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> so as we are in between the time scales of weather and climate, we take advantage of both sorts of predictability. The predictability that comes from the initial conditions from weather and the predictability that comes from the boundary conditions for the climate side. So in between, we have this mixed problem and we come with the predictability coming from the Madden and Julian oscillation, which is an important source of predictability for this time scale. And in terms of boundary conditions, we rely on the memory of soil moisture, snow covers, snow pack, sea ice, and sea surface temperatures. And another important aspect of this time scale, as well as the climate time scale, is that we are going to be looking at averages over some periods. In the subseasonal predictions, weeks or 15 days or something like that. And on the seasonal and climate time scale, longer time averages. So the model we are going to be looking at is this uh, Brazilian atmospheric model, which was uh, recently, three years ago, uh, developed by uh, our group at CPTEC in collaboration with several other institutions in Brazil, uh, led by uh, Silvio Nilo Figueroa. And it's currently used for weather prediction operationally at our center. But this model has never been used for uh, subseasonal predictions. So what we have decided was to try to um, come up with the first assessment of this model, is extending the predictions up to a few days in the future, covering a few weeks, and aiming to determine which model configuration has the best performance for this time scale. And this is aligned with a large international activity that is going on in the World Weather and World Climate Research Program, which is the subseasonal to seasonal prediction project called S2S. So we are going to be giving special attention to a few characteristics of the model configuration in terms of vertical resolution, deep convection, uh, boundary layer parametrization, and soil moisture initialization. And we didn't make any change on the horizontal resolution. We chose a, a about 100 kilometer resolution model. So these are the configurations. And the model is called BAN 1.2, which is an evolution of the initially published uh, model by Figueroa in uh, 2006, because there were new components that were included in the model. And the new components are those that are in, in blue. It's a new uh, convective uh, parameterization scheme called Revised Simplified Arakawa Schubert that was not implemented and is now in, uh, available. And also a new boundary layer a scheme that's called Bretton Park Moist Scheme. So what we did was to come up with this matrix where we varied either the vertical resolution from 42 or 64 vertical levels 
a convective parameterization between this new one that I mentioned and the old one that's called the Grau de Veni. Uh, boundary layer, including the new one that I just mentioned and the old one that was already implemented, which is the Mallory Yamada scheme. And initialization of soil moisture, either using climatological conditions or uh, observations close to the initial time of running the model. And then we came up with six possible um, configurations and the, 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 the acronyms for them you can see here. And they are related to A, if you have the Arakawa configuration, G, if you have the Grail configuration for convection, B, if you have the Bretton Park for boundary layer, <laughs> M, if you have the Mallory Yamada, and C for climatological soil moisture, and G for initialization with observed initial conditions for the soil moisture. So uh, to initialize the model, we need some variables, which are uh, the zonal and meridional wind, specific humidity, which are temperature and ozone in 35 vertical levels from surface up to 50 hectopascal, uh, surface pressure, sea surface temperature, and sea ice. Then for the initialization, what we used for the era entering your analysis for the atmospheric variables and also for sea ice and sea surface temperatures. For soil moisture, you use the climatological monthly data sets and also the initialization using the observed data from the global land data assimilation systems from the previous month of the start date of the prediction, which has a more closer uh, resemblance with the observational uh, humidity than if you look at climatological initialization. In terms of uh, hindcasts, what we did, we chose a period of 12 years, and we decided to look at what we call the extended austral summer, which is from November to March. So it's five months for each year, for starting from the 1999 to 2000 summer and the last summer, 2010 to 2011. And this is an important period for the South American monsoon, as we already seen here during the workshop. And uh, as we don't have a lot of computational resources to initialize the model every day, we decided to initialize the model twice a month, near the beginning and near the middle of the month to generate the hindcast for these uh, 12 years. So in total, what we have, we have 10 hindcasts per extended summer, which is the product of five months times the two initialization dates. And as we are running the model for 12 years, that means that for each configuration of those six different configurations, we have to run the model 120 times for the next uh, 35 days. And uh, what we looked at is to look at what does the quality of this forecast produce for the first week between day one and seven, second week, day eight, 14, third week, uh, days 15 to 21, and fourth week, day 22 to 28. And in terms of strategy for initializing the boundary conditions, we use persistence. So we just kept the initial uh, persistence of the observed sea for surface temperature and sea ice in the beginning of the integration through the 35 days of integration. And the variables we looked at are precipitation, two meter temperature, and the RMM, the index that Alice mentioned and introduced yesterday, uh, the Wheeler and Handel index for the Amada and Julian oscillation. And in terms of metrics, we looked at correlation between the observed anomalies and the predicted anomalies and the root mean square error for those four weeks. And uh, we know that the weekly averages are good because we want to take advantage of the averaging for coming up with some predictability on these time scales. And we know that they have greater, greater ability in these models in represented weekly values than daily information. So that's why we usually do this uh, averaging across weeks. And uh, we also looked at the uh, means, global means between the bounds of 60 north and 60 south for the four lead times to see globally how is the quality of these predictions. And for the MJO, we use the traditional bivariate correlation and root mean square error for the lead times from zero up to 30 days. 
Observational data for evaluating these uh, hindcasts were the GPCP that was already mentioned several times here, and the uh, ear entering for temperature. And for the um, Mother and Julian oscillation, RMM, we used the air entering winds at 800 to 200 hectopascal and the NOAA OLR for the outgoing long wave radiation. Starting with the results for uh, precipitation. So it's bad, the quality, right? Sorry. Uh, what we did was to compute then the correlation between uh, the observed and the predicted anomalies for the four weeks, as you see for the columns, and the, and the six configurations. So what you clearly see is that the six configurations show very similar correlation patterns. If you go here, you see that in general, the pattern doesn't change much. The correlation is high during the first week and for most regions and quickly drops as lead times increases. You see the first column is always uh, with color, uh, higher colors than the others. We have greater correlation over the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere during the first two weeks. And this is basically because the model is likely to predict better the winter baroclinic weather systems associated with fronts in the northern hemisphere for this time of the year. So you can see that difference. Um, week three and four, uh, we have uh, significant correlations. I just didn't mention, but all the values that are shown in the previous slides are only those that are statistically significant above the threshold for the 120 hindcasts that we produced. And this, uh, when you go to week three and four, we start to see only on the tropical band the the, the signal and the quality of the prediction is kept for longer lead times, mostly on the tropical bands after the initialization weeks. And the six uh, configuration have very negligible correlation values near the subtropical highs, uh, particularly for the first week and desert regions. And this is associated uh, with the difficulty in the models and simulate very little precipitation amounts on these regions. And we also have very high correlation in the first lead time, uh, which is associated with the uh, predictability coming from the initial conditions. And uh, for the longer lead times, we have the predictability coming from the boundary conditions from the ENSO and the MJO. And in general, we will see that in a bit more detail in the next slides, we will have a zoom on these results. But the first row of the previous slide, which is the, using the Arakawa Schubert deep convection and the uh, Betaton Park boundary layer, shows slightly better results than the other configurations. So looking now at comparing pairs of those configurations to understand the effect of all these things that we changed, started with the impact of vertical resolution for this uh, comparison of the Arakawa Schubert version with this Bretterton Park boundary layer and climatological uh, soil moisture. So in the top, we have this configuration with 42 vertical levels at the bottom with 64 vertical levels. And we see that the increase in vertical resolution doesn't make a lot of change in the precipitation correlation levels. And this is also true if you change the convection and keep the boundary layer and the soil moisture for the grelk the vd convection we again see that the top 42 and the bottom 64 configuration doesn't make a lot of difference in terms of improving the quality of the predictions for weeks one to four uh, now looking at the impact of soil moisture so here we are comparing the both in 42 vertical levels uh, with the revised simplifier Akawa Schuber and the Bretton Park boundary layer. So the first row, we have the climatological uh, soil moisture initialization, and the bottom row, you have the initialization with the observed uh, data from the gel dust. So again, what you see is that there is not a lot of difference between what we found with climatological compared to what we found with the initialization closer to real conditions. Uh, and uh, again, is this uh, is looking at a, a way of how we compare the deep convection in terms of uh, what is the impact of using grell in the bottom row with uh, the Arakawa Schubert in the first row. 
you see that in general, the simplified Arakawa Schubert, that's the first row, shows slightly better and higher values of correlations than the modified Grel uh, Deveni convection scheme. And this was with this 42 levels. And if we look at the comparison again for the same convective parameterizations for the 64 levels, you also see that we have a slight ad advantage for the Arakawa Schuber compared to the modified Grail de Veni parameterization. In terms of uh, the effect of uh, the boundary layer parameterization, here we are comparing the same convection scheme, Arakawa Schuber, and uh, soil moisture initialization climatologically with two different boundary conditions for the boundary, boundary layer. Uh, the, the top, we have the one with the Bretton Park, and the bottom one, you have the one with the Mallory Yamada parameterization. And you can see that the top one with the Bretton Park has slightly better uh, uh, correlation than the Mallory Yamada. And then after we did all that, we found that in general, the first row of all those plots of, uh, that we had before, which is this parameterization with uh, uh, Arakawa and uh, Bretton Park boundary layer and climatological conditions for soil moisture is the one that seems to be uh, the slightly better than the others. We chose that one, and that is the top row that you can see. And then we decided to compare that one with an ensemble. When we use an ensemble of the six parameterizations that we run, so we have six uh, model runs, so we made the ensemble mean of those, and that's the second row. And also we perturbed the top one and generated an ensemble of six members to compare also with this uh, multiple configuration parameterization uh, scheme ensemble on the middle row with the bottom one, that is the top one, but perturbed with six members. And when, if you look at that, you can see that there is a clear gain when you have an ensemble compared to the deterministic uh, control member that is just one run at the top. And in terms of comparing the two multimodal systems, uh, multi-ensemble systems, it's very comparable between the two. Moving on now to the errors that we see in the six um, uh, configurations. Uh, what we found is that the errors grow as lead time increases. As you can see, the first uh, week has less errors. As you go longer, the errors, the anomalies grow. The errors grow more in the, from the first to the second week than from the week two to the next one. So they have a larger jump of error in the beginning, and then the error is not growing much, grows, but not as much later. Uh, the highest errors are found in these regions where we have the ITCZ, the Indian Ocean, the Maritime Continent, the South Pacific Conversion Zone, the South Atlantic Conversion Zone, which are the regions which have the strongest subseasonal variability, as you can see. Uh, the configuration with this revised simplifier, Kaba Schuber, and the moist uh, Bretton Park uh, boundary layer have the uh, errors that are smallest, and they do not differ greatly from one another. So this is looking at the first three lines, and they are very similar between them. The configuration using the other parameterization, the Grail, the Veni, don't uh, differ also between them much and in, have a slightly larger errors than the other ones. So it's comparing, sorry, comparing the fifth and the fourth and the fifth line here, these two lines with these top ones, you see that these ones are very similar, these ones are very similar between them, and those ones have a slightly less error than these ones. And then the refined, the revised simplified Arakawa Schuber seem to be better than the Grell, and the increasing resolution in soil moisture doesn't seem to change much the errors. Again, looking at the ensembles of this multiple configuration compared to the ensemble of a single configuration but perturbed, you can see that the one that was chosen so far as the 
with the better correlation and the smallest errors is likely compared to the others. Uh, is this one on the top that I mentioned before. Uh, when you do an ensemble of six members of the six configurations in the middle and also the perturbation of the top one, the generating ensemble for the bottom, you clearly see that you have a reduction on the error. So the ensemble approach is an important you know, approach for the subseasonal prediction for reducing the errors. But the errors between the two uh, perturb uh, ensemble approach are very similar between them. And this can be better seen and easierly seen if we look at this plot, which show the errors across the lead times average globally between 6 north and 6 south. So yeah, starting from, from the summary, clearly we can see here that the, the ensemble approaches have a much reduced error compared to the single member for the multiple configurations alone. So it's clearly important to have an ensemble for making subseasonal predictions. Uh, we also see that the Grau, the Veni, which is the ones that have the green and the yellow lines, have a much larger error than the simplifier Akao Schuber, which are those that are here in, in the second pack of results. And if we compare the one that has the 42 with the 64 resolution in this pack of the simplified Arakawa Schuber, they are very similar to each other. If we compare, there's a black and an orange line that are very close to each other. Uh, and this is also true here if we look at the comparison of the green, the grail parameterization of 62 and uh, 64, there is a very small difference between them. So increasing the vertical resolution doesn't seem to decrease a lot the error. And also, the initialization of soil moisture doesn't contribute much or reducing the error. So you can compare here the black and the blue lines that are very close to each other. And then uh, the last point is that the dry modified uh, Mallory Yamada boundary layer, is the red line, uh, has uh, less error for the last two lead times here. <laughs> And similar analysis for the correlation. Again, you can see clearly that the two ensemble approaches have the largest correlations, indicating that it's important to have an ensemble. And the, in general, there is a nearly exponential drop of the correlation as a function of lead time. And the simplified Arakawa Schuber uh, and Moist Bretton Park, uh, that is the black, orange, and the blue lines, which are here in this top pack have uh, <coughs> largest errors, largest values of correlation compared to the other configurations which are in the bottom here. So indicating advantage of the Arakawa with Betterton Park compared to the other one that is the Grau with the modified Mallory Yamada here in the bottom. And as previously no noted, also the vertical resolution doesn't result in increasing correlation. We, we can see if we compare the black line with the orange one and also if you compare the yellow line with the green line for the other parameterization. And soil moisture initialization doesn't seem to change much the correlation. Again, comparing the blue line with the black line that are very close to each other. Now looking at similar results for temperature, we have again the four weeks and the six configurations. You can clearly see that uh, the level of uh, correlation is much higher than the precipitation, up to four weeks. So the, that's the first point. The six configuration have better performance in temperature than in precipitation. The six configuration also have a very similar pattern correlation for the four weeks, and the correlations uh, values decrease as lead time increases. That is what we saw also for temperature for precipitation. Uh, the higher correlation values are noticed over the cloud-free oceanic regions. So all those uh, very dark uh, regions where we have usually less clouds. Uh, however, the significant um, uh, subseasonal correlation values exist also over other portions of the globe and over land. 
And over the extratropical continents, uh, we have a stronger correlation values, which are restricted in weeks three uh, and four, for example, over some regions in the southeast US, northern South America, and some regions of South Asia. And uh, over the tropical regions, the correlation values are low in the regions with high convective activities, for example, the maritime continent. You can see that over the maritime continent, there is usually a, a white spot here. Uh, looking more closely to this uh, comparison, again, for the different pairs of uh, experiments to identify the impacts of each change we made in the model, starting with the impact on diff convection. Uh, so we have here in the top row the the scheme when we use the uh, Bretton Park for the boundary layer and climatological soil moisture and with 42 vertical levels and comparing the top row, the revised simplifier Akawa Schuber with the bottom row with the GREL convective scheme. And we can see that the uh, Arakawa Schuber and modified uh, 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 GREL Devenie schemes have the same level of correlation for the temperatures uh, for the four weeks. So there is not a large difference between the two. Uh, looking at the impact of the boundary layer uh, scheme, comparing again uh, on the top the scheme with the simplified Arakawa Schuber in soil, climatological soil moisture and, and with the Mallory Yamada scheme on the bottom and Bretton Park boundary layer scheme on the top, we can see that the Mallory Yamada, that the bottom one is a little bit worse than the, the first one. So the Bretton Park scheme seems to be better for temperatures. Impact of vertical resolution, now keeping all the three other variations the same and only changing 42 and 64 levels for the Arakawa uh, convective scheme, uh, Bretton Park and soil moisture. You can see that there is uh, very slightly differences between these two schemes indicating that vertical resolution uh, is very similar, but there is some slight uh, reductions in some extratropical regions. And we have the same result if we look at the deep convection uh, grail scheme for the 42 and the 62 vertical levels. And in terms of uh, impact of soil moisture, um, here we can see that the initialization of soil moisture for this uh, scheme using the simplifier Akawa Schuber and Bretton Park, and then the top with climatological soil moisture and at the bottom with the initialized closer to the observed soil moisture, uh, has some impact, particularly in weeks uh, two and three. And uh, this is a slight improvement. Uh, in, in general, there is a slight improvement in the two meter temperature correlation in the central regions of Australia, South and North America, and in Africa for those two weeks. Uh, looking at now what we found for the errors of those uh, six experiments for the four weeks, uh, we clearly see a lot of uh, red on the extratropics and not much errors in general for the global uh, areas. So for all configurations, the errors again grow with lead time and they are greatly lower over the oceanic regions than over the continental regions for all lead times. The higher, the higher errors, as I mentioned, are noticed over the northern hemisphere regions where there are these interactions between mid latitude clinic systems and tropical convection, uh, usually associated with the MMJO and the circulation of the teleconnections through um, Rosby waves. And the uh, errors are lower over the southern hemisphere because there are fewer continental regions than over the northern hemisphere and baroclinic instability is lower at this time of the year in the southern hemisphere. And summary for this uh, results of temperatures in a similar way we saw for um, precipitation. Uh, we clearly see uh, the, 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 the gain uh, of the ensemble approach here that you can see from these lines that are on the top with a larger correlation than any individual 
configuration and a smaller error compared to any individual configuration. And this six uh, configuration shows a dissimilar drop in correlation and rise in the error as function of lead time. The increase in the vertical resolution and change in the deep convection scheme and soil moisture do not influence the level of correlation and error values for the two meter temperature, which is uh, consistent with what we found for the precipitation. And the differences in performance levels are noticed when we compare the moist uh, scheme of the boundary layer, the Bretton Park, with the dry uh, scheme for the Mallory Armada, which is the red line, which is has the highest error and the smallest correlation. And, and this is uh, the worst of all configurations. So it's clearly that we are not going to choose the Mallory Armada boundary layer for our uh, subseasonal prediction. And what about the Madden and Julian oscillation? So these are the results for the bivariate correlation on the left and the <coughs> root mean square error on the right for the, all the configurations and the ensemble of these uh, six configurations and the ensemble of the best chosen best configuration, which are the dashed lines. Again, we see clearly that the ensemble increases the correlation and reduces the error, so it's a good approach. Uh, the configuration with the Mallory Amada parameterization is the one that has the fastest drop in error and the fast in correlation and the fastest rise in the error. So it's the worst of all. So we are not going to use that one. And in general, all of them have a similar uh, behavior for the Madden and Julian oscillation, reaching the level of uh, skill that we usually uh, attribute for finding how good these predictions are, which is this level of 0 0.5 in about 20 days, 18 or 19 days here, which is about the same level that it takes to reach the error of about 1.4 here, which is about in this time scale. And the, this one drops very quickly for 12 days and 11 days. So we have much worse performance on those. Uh, and then we also looked at how our model compares with other models of this uh, subseasonal to seasonal prediction pro project. So uh, our model is an atmospheric only model, so we chose other S2S models who are also atmospheric only. So the second row is the Canadian model, which is also atmospheric model. The third row is the Japanese model, he's also uh, atmospheric only. And the last two, the Australian and ECMWF, are coupled models. So if you compare the skill of the models in terms of correlation, in general, ECMWF is usually the best, and it's not a different story here. But if you compare the model of the, from Brazil with the other atmospheric models, there is about the, in the same sort of level of correlation. And for the Madden and Julian oscillation, too. So this is the uh, performance of these uh, international models uh, for the Madden and Julian oscillation. The solid lines are the ensemble means, and the uh, dotted lines are the single member predictions, the quality of single member predictions. And you can see that, in general, all these models are uh, the best model is the CMWF, which reaches the 0 0.5 level in more than 30 days. All the other models are here in the middle, around 20-something days, and our model is here, as we saw, in about 20 days, which is a bit lo uh, longer than the Canadian model that is here, about 17 days. And the errors is, tells about the same story. Our model has a competitive performance to other atmospheric models. So in summary, what we did, we did this assessment of the quality of our model in trying to make, uh, finding a configuration for the Austro summer and identifying which one works best. And we changed the vertical resolution, physical parameterization, soil moisture. We found that the six uh, configurations show better performance for temperature than for precipitation. Uh, the six configurations produce the highest precipitation temperature anomaly correlation levels for the first week and then decreases the correlation levels for weeks two to four. Uh, 
For weeks three and four, we found moderate precipitation correlation levels, which were restricted to the Equatorial Pacific, which is a feature that is also found in several other models that I haven't shown them all here, but it's common. We have seen four. Uh, for precipitation anomalies, uh, the error increases with lead time, and the highest errors values were found over the regions with strong subseasonal variability, as we saw ITCZ, the Indian Ocean, Maritime Continent, South Pacific, and Atlantic Convergence Zones. For two meter temperature, the errors increase with lead time, and the highest uh, errors values were found over the Northern Hemisphere, where the interaction between anomalous convection and mid latitude circulation are noticed. Increasing vertical resolution uh, from 42 to 64 level didn't uh, increase a lot uh, the, the quality of the predictions, both for, uh, uh, particularly for precipitation. There is a little bit of hint of possible increase for temperature and Monday in June. For precipitation, the model configurations with the revised simplified alcohol Schuber deep convection show better performance compared to the GREL deep convection. The two parameterizations show uh, particularly for the same uh, performance for temperature anomalies and the Madden and Julian oscillation. The moist skin for the boundary layer show better performance uh, for temperature and Madden and Julian oscillation than the dry skin. We found greater difference uh, in the Madden and Julian predictions uh, where the bivariate correlation decreased with, uh, sharply in this Mallory Amada uh, configuration. So this is not a good one to be used. We, not, we haven't found important impact in the use of different ways of initializing the soil and moisture for making our predictions. We found just some slight improvements in some continental regions by making this change in the soil and moisture. So after doing all this, the configuration that is, seems to be the best to be used is this 142 ABC, which has uh, 42 vertical levels, use the Arakawa Schuber deep convection and moist uh, Bretton Park boundary layer and climatological soil moisture. And for that, we have performed an ensemble of initial conditions perturbing the control member and generating five additional members. And, and with this six uh, member configuration, uh, we also used to form this um, ensemble and compare with another ensemble, uh, which is co composed of the six uh, configurations that we performed. And when we compare these two uh, approaches, we found that we, and compare with the single member ensemble, we found that it's important to have this uh, ensemble approach for improving our predictions. For precipitation and temperature predictions, these improvements are particularly noticed in the extratropical regions. And uh, it's, uh, the performance of our model is uh, somehow uh, comparable to other S2S models that are also atmospheric only. And this is also true for the Madden and Julian oscillation. Um, and uh, what we found is that the multimodal ensemble mean for for the six configurations show very similar performance to the one that has the uh, ensemble produced by perturbing just one single uh, configuration. So this is a summary of what we have been doing. So I'm finishing here and happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi, Kayo. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your talk. Very nice. I was wondering, uh, do you have a feeling of how much ENSO contributes to sub-seasonal mm. uh, predictions? You, yeah. you mentioned at some point ENSO, yeah. then you didn't. Yeah, it, it, it does, but seems to be not a lot, because we published recently a paper and one of the questions of the reviewer was that. We compared the 11 S2S models and have exactly the same plots, and, they, and we said, oh, this is coming from Enzo and the MJO. And the reviewer asked, well, how do you know how much is coming from Enzo, how much is coming from MJO? And then uh, one of the suggestions was to remove linearly by regression the effect of Enzo from those 
and you removed. And it, it kept, keeps us still a lot of skill some, coming from something else. So it comes, but it doesn't seem to be a lot. There's something else that is also contributing to the quality. So if you take the ENSO years, no, no, we, we, and then, no, no, just uh, another, another, way another of doing approach. It. Uh -huh. If you take the ENSO years, like a forecast of opportunity, I mean, uh -huh. ENSO plus yeah. MJO yeah. may give you more. Yeah, there amount. are some studies that are trying to find these uh, particular opportunities to see if that is the case. But if you look at all the results of all the hindcasts and try to remove the, in, the signal of ENSO from that and do the, again the correlation without the ENSO. In, included there, is there is still some skill left. That was a very nice talk. Could you go back to the uh, slide that you have the uh, temperature anomaly correlation that you compare different configurations? All of them together? Uh, no, separate uh, pairs. Okay, which which one? The first one? Uh, that's the first one. Okay, yes, that's one. So over Indonesia, uh, the errors are already large in week one, and there was another example that was really large. Right, so the, the correlations, are, yes, that's the, the yeah. bottom curve. So do you know what's happening? Yeah, I think uh, our model is not a coupled model, so there, be, there should be some coupling important there that is generating, that's missing, that is generating error in the prediction. Probably. Okay, now for the MJO, the, the plots that you showed, you, you have the, uh, the MJO index, and yeah. that's the, the correlation with all? For, for, for our model or for the comparison with the international model? Um, one that you showed, the RMM. Yeah, yeah, but there are two. One that's for our own model, and there is other one that's yeah, comparing with other models too. For the, for the BAM model. This is for our model. Yeah, so you have the RMM index and you did the correlation between the model and the, uh, the verification, right? So regardless if there was an MJO or not. Yeah, that's using all the hindcasts. There is no okay. MJO phasing uh, stratification. Yeah, it would yeah. be interesting to, because you have two initializations a day, a uh, month. A month. So you may Just have the initial. Conditional skill, yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be good, be yeah. And also, if the model is able to, uh, forecast the eastward propagation of the MJO? Yeah, uh, in that case, it's a bit difficult to do. It's easier if we do that in AMIC runs, that you have a very long, uh, continuous um, simulation, and that we did, we have, and we saw uh, the, those graphs that people do, this diagnostics that the MJO task force uh, suggests, and you can see that the MJO propagates to the east, right? But uh, the model seems to have a more uh, zonal propagation is not as quick as what we we have in reality. So we found that that's a weakness of the model. And this is also consistent with the problem that we find in other GCMs, that also atmospheric GCMs forced with observed temperature over a long AMIP run, and we find that they have difficulty to make the MJO to propagate to the east. Okay, thank you. I, I, I have a, um, two questions. <laughs> One, wouldn't it be expected that have a, a better uh, predictability of temperature than precipitation because of the correlation? Okay. Uh, but the other question is, um, have you done any analysis more regional? Like, um, what's the predictability of active and break phases of the monsoon and how the model performs? No, we haven't. But yeah, that's something that is important. Yeah, we haven't. Thank you. Yeah, Kai, I would like to make a question which I made you in last segment meeting. But before doing that, I would like to congratulate made the prediction at S2S time scale be available with the uh, with the CPTEC <coughs> model. 
at least for you because it's not uh, available for investigation or for yeah, that because we, we, we are not formally uh, involved in contributing with data for the S2S project. So we started four years later. So we started last year that the S2S project started in 2014. So we are a bit delayed. But at some point when we are ready, we hopefully will be able to contribute with data there too. So the planning to, to, me, to make the data available, it's not uh, during this year. No, no. There is no plan for when, because this is a research project we are developing. Then we have to internally decide if this is good enough to become operational in our center, and then we see what we're going to make the data, if it's going to be available, and when, and where. But so far, there is no plans for this model data to be made available. Okay. But it shows very good result. Adolfo precipitation seems like he has a um, weaker skill because the, uh, uh, the root mean square uh, is much uh, bigger. Uh, but for first time, it's a good result. Sorry, I didn't get your question. I was, I was saying that uh, the root mean square uh, for precipitation is uh, much bigger. Mm -hmm. And of course, for temperature, as you, yeah. I like to say, uh, 1,4 uh, value, which is uh, acceptable. Uh, my comment is that uh, although the root mean square error for precipitation is much longer, or is much bigger, uh, for first time, uh, your model is uh, uh, performing uh, well. Yeah, the, the the point is that it's big when you have individual members. When you have an ensemble, you can see that you can make it reduce. So there is some hope, but we know that for weeks three and four, the quality is much lower than for the first week. So unfortunately, the and this is true for all the models. So we have to have an expectation, but not too high for this quality of these predictions for week three and four. Hi, Caillou. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I, I have a questions about the vertical resolution. Uh, the 42 and 64 is equally distrib distribution, or there is a, a higher resolution in the troposphere, or a higher resolution in the stratosphere? How yeah, is the uh, distribution? Yeah, it's not uh, completely uniform. It's a bit better in the lower part of the atmosphere and a bit less on the top of the atmosphere. And uh, one of the problems that we think it's uh, not helping us to identify the um, impact of increasing the resolution vertically on the quality is because we had to download the or initial conditions for the atmosphere in 37 levels and interpolate both in 64 and in 42. So perhaps if we had more vertical levels on the initial conditions, we would see more impact on what we are doing here. But we have a fixed 37 level to be interpolated for both sides. So this probably is one of the reasons why we are not finding a lot of change in increase in quality with these two resolutions. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Well, okay, we have coffee break and let's be back at 12. Thank you again. Thank you.